Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 428. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 15th of August. If you're in Eastern Christendom, it's the Feast of the Dormition of Our Lady. If you're in Western Christendom, it's the Feast of the Assumption. And if you're an Anglican, you get to pick and choose a bit. <laughs> or fast. Or fast, <laughs> yes. All right, welcome to another program. Something available only this century uh, due to the love of Skype. I get to uh, Skype my good friend Gavin. We get to sit and talk about news. Um, before we do all that, I have some instructions for the viewer. I need you to like the program. So if you're on Facebook or you're on YouTube and you have the ability to like or do a thumbs up or whatever, go for it. Before you watch an episode, you need to share it. You don't want to wait till afterwards because you may change your mind. Please share this episode with your clergy, friends, if you're clergy with your parish. If you want to add a comment, lots of people have been commenting more and more frequently on the YouTube. We read all the comments um, and uh, <clears throat> apparently the comment section is called the correction section because <laughs> <laughs> whenever Gavin or George and I are just a little off, somebody's there to point it out. And I'm not laughing, you know, we really do appreciate that because it helps a lot. If you have not subscribed yet in um, to this, go to the YouTube channel and click subscribe. If you see that little bell symbol next to it, that's the instant notification symbol. If you click that, you'll get an email right away when uh, there's a new episode. We also have podcasts. Uh, click the show notes, and in there is a link to the podcast, and you guys should be all set. Um, let's see. I, we, I don't think we need to do a health update. You doing okay? Yes, I, I'm, I'm doing so much better. Mm -hmm. um, um, so thank you. Yes, I'm I'm getting better all the time. That's Praise good. the Lord. All right. right. How, how's George? George, last I heard, is doing better. Uh, and I, I told you guys last week that I cut my finger. It became infected, <laughs> and I had to go to the doctor, and he gave oh, me no. pills. And I go, this isn't going to turn into sepsis, is it? Mr. Coulson, what are you, a wimp? No, 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 just give me the pills. <laughs> so <laughs> I live in fear. <laughs> uh, I, I'm a hypochondriac. It's the way it goes. Uh, we have a lot of news to talk about. Um, uh, it's hard to have a, a wonderful countenance where... Uh, you see joy in my life and happiness when I have to report on some very sad news. Uh, specifically, there is a report from a grand jury here in Pennsylvania uh, announcing that uh, some 300 priests uh, over a period of years had uh, raped, molested, uh, and done horrible things to some 1,000 victims uh, under the age of 18. And uh, as a Christian, as a member of the large, you know, little C Catholic Church, uh, right here, Gavin hurts. It, it hurts to, to to report and stuff like this. Kevin, it's enough to make any of us, to give any of us terminal disillusion mm -hmm. with the church. I mean, after all, we're all we're all pretty disillusioned with it already. And you know, one one of the reasons that this program is happening is because you and George began to say there are there are things in the church that need to be brought brought out into the light mm -hmm. that are skulking in the corners and um, and what we've so so already many of us are wounded by the church, let down by the church, belong to the church. We're 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 both victims and perpetrators ourselves to some extent, but nonetheless, there are moments when it's profoundly upsetting and we discover dark corners where terrible things have been happening. I think I was thinking about this and, and wondering, well, I, 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 I think if you like, there's a there's a, a judgmental way of looking at this and there's a, there's a spiritual way. I don't mean to be too, uh, too shallow, but I mean, clearly the judgmental and the accusatory way is to say, well, the church is so full of hypocrites how can we give it any more space? How, how much more paedophilia can we cope with being exposed? How much more lying, cover-up, escapism, cowardice, betrayal, faithlessness, whatever? Boy, you have all the uh, adjectives for this. Uh, clearly, you've thought of it a lot, because uh, in the pre-show, I, I, I expressed my anger uh, in all this, because stuff like this, even for Christians, you look at this with absolute disgust. Why go to church anyway you know it, enough for what the, the secular is going to do and for the pagans and for the press 
Um, even Christians look at this and say, I'm disgusted. I can't. The, the church is making victims. I think the answer partly lies in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John tells us very clearly that the world is occupied by evil. And as I was thinking and praying about this, I, I, I just had a picture of D-Day in the D-Day beaches. Uh, kind of an excerpt from Saving Private Ryan or sure. something similar. Yeah. And, and the, the fact is what, what the church is doing is it, it's invading enemy territory. And as people pile out onto the sands of enemy territory to, ca to recapture it for Jesus, there are a lot of casualties. It's a very serious struggle. And without offering any excuses for people who fall, um, we can expect a certain uh, a certain high proportion of people who fail. E even amongst the apostles, uh, one out of twelve of them betrayed Jesus. That, that's you know that's nearly a, a ten percent attrition rate. Mm -hmm. um, for those who'd seen our Lord and knew Him, so this is not to make excuses, but I think it's to put it in the context of what the church is doing. The church is trying to wrest back the earth from Satan by by the blood of Christ, by the forgiveness of Christ, and and if if it's all very well saying, well, can I go on belonging to church? But imagine we, imagine the church stopped or disappeared. Where, where is the salt? Where is the light? Of course, there are bits of salt and light in people who, uh, you know, rather like the, the um, Roman uh, fellow travelers in Palestine had an instinct for God. But uh, I, I don't think we should allow these terrible sins and grave disorders to make us disillusioned with the church. I think we should, they, what they should really do is to say, look, we're all in the firing line. We're all in trouble. Our only hope is in repentance. And, <clears throat> and, and we can't afford to give up because the battle is really very serious. No, we can't give up. You got to keep going on. Um, and, but all of you, all the viewers out there, just take moments this week and pray for the victims you know there there are people uh from pennsylvania who are you know are in their 20s 30s 40s 50s who are still struggling as victims of um clergy in pennsylvania now mm. also now if 300 of these existed in pennsylvania think of other dioceses around the world think of other denominations uh anglicanism is you know not immune uh, Willow Creek out of uh, the Midwest has done it. It doesn't seem any denomination is really a moon. We can say, oh, the, obviously they're pedophiles and this is just a Roman Catholic thing. No, sin exists in all church, all denominations, and I, I can't point to one and say we're holier than you. But I, I'd like to, to, to say that, that for, for those of us who are coming back to a more biblical orthodoxy, sure. uh, and you know that includes me, I, I, I had 10 years as a uh, as uh, not a creedal liberal, but an ethical liberal for sure. Uh, one of the things that's brought me back is, is, is a sense precisely of how flawed we all are and how important sin is. And I think a justification for an orthodox Christian show like this is that uh, we are determined to take the fact that s of sin seriously. People need saving, turning, helping, repenting. We're not we try not to be judgmental and cast moral stones. Uh, if we have a passion for the, the truth as it is in the gospel, it, it partly comes out of a realistic anthropology of the frailty of ourselves and then, then of other people. And I have to, I, I just like to say that, that in, in my 40 years as a priest, I've heard a number of confessions. I've had a number of people weep on my shoulder. One of the things that God does is he takes people who've sinned and, he, and, and, and when they repent, he mends them and he gives them another chance. I'm not saying everyone always gets another chance, but I'm saying that's that's part of the gospel narrative. And some of the best clergy and Christians I know are people who fell flat on their face at some point, were horrified at their own weakness, were mended by the Holy Spirit, and have gone back into the fight with renewed vigor and a deeper self-knowledge and a deeper compassion for other people too. All right. Another success of this program, Unscripted and Anglican TV, is pointing out hypocrisy. Um, there's a lot of hypocrisy. <laughs> you... <laughs> ah, no smiling. Uh, no cheeky smirk. No, no, no. Is to point out hypocrisy uh, uh, when we see it, uh, either within teaching, within practice, uh, within um, history, tradition, experience. Uh, all those those roles, and so um, we kind of you know we try not to be hypocrites ourselves, um, but when we see it, we say, wait a minute, 
you said this before and now you're doing this now and i kind of want to bring up uh you know another tragic event that happened on, on the shores of england um the camps and i thought uh, gavin would be a great chance to talk about what happened before in the early 80s and what the archbishop said he knew and didn't know uh, i want you to give us a little background and tell us uh, a little bit about the story okay so first of all confession i can feel my inner pharisee growing as we speak yeah. and i'm and i'm and i'm genuinely sorry for that and i'll try also i've been hung out to dry on the bbc television today and so i'm feeling a bit, I'm feeling, <laughs> I'm feeling a little bit like i'd like somebody else to suffer a bit because i suffered it, so it, I it, well, hold on hold on in the show notes i'm going to put a link to the the video of you on the bbc here's the setup Usually when a, a very liberal program wants to get their point across, they'll, you know, side it. And in siding it, they'll have 20 liberals versus one conservative. And they say, well, that's a fair discussion. What could go wrong? Uh, in Gavin's case, he had four females and the host and himself, and he was the only opposing view to all this. And it was just, it was slaughter. And it wasn't was Gavin's fault. It wasn't your fault. Uh, nor because I see the studio. I I was completely blind doing it by Skype, <laughs> and they they were not they were not kind to me. No, they were not. <laughs> <laughs> I a, at the end, I thought you could be a Me Too victim. I mean, they just it was so <laughs> bad. So I'll I'll put a link to it, and you'll have more appreciation for Anglican Unscripted, where you know both Gavin and I feed off each other. Uh, he can see my face as I talk, and I can see his face, unless you're watching the audio podcast. Sorry about that. And you know, we, we work off at each other, and it allows us to interrupt each other without really interrupting. He'll see that I want to say something. I'll see that he wants to say something. And that's how it works. When you are blind uh, in a studio or blind on Skype, it's horrid and because uh, you don't know what they're talking about. You know what they're talking about, but you don't know the facial expressions. And that's the whole magic to video. On to the camps. So there is these camps called Ewan, spelled, you, you, you know, there's this great gap okay. between Hold how on. English sounds and how it's spelled. It's Go for spelled it. I W I W E R N E, um, but but pronounced Ewan. These these are Bible camps for for young evangelicals, and they're run by a small group of what we call public school, but you would call private school. So it's a very privileged part of society. Uh, and Christians at, at, at privileged private, brackets, public schools in their teens are taken away on camps. And the intention, a good intention, is to make the next generation of evangelical Anglican church leaders. Um, that's the good side. The bad side of it, as a number of people have lamented, is um, if you didn't go to exactly the right flavor of school or you weren't involved on the, right on the camps or your parents didn't have quite the right social kudos, you, you may not have got quite to belong to these extremely snobby circles. But given the fact there was already extreme snobbishness in the English caste system, at least these camps were trying to make Christians and set up Christian leaders. Um, the problem that, that has come out recently is that uh, the, the great leader, a guy called John Smythe, who was a barrister and a QC, um, uh, and who was running them in the 1970s and, and early 80s, he suddenly disappeared in the 1980s and just disappeared. Uh, and in 1982, um, a complaint was made that he'd taken one of these boys and he'd beaten him in a shed as a sp on, on a bare bottom uh, as spiritual discipline until he bled. Um, and then, um, so this this came out in the early 80s. And Well, did this come out before or after he disappeared? Um, about the same time. About the same time, okay, all right. Uh, then, then it all goes quiet. Um, so people get to put two and two together. Maybe they talk, maybe they don't. We don't know how much people talk, except we kind of do because people talk. Um, but, but in 2000, and so, but Justin Welby was on the staff of these camps uh, and was there. We, we just we have at the moment we have a wonderful political scenario with Jeremy Corbyn being caught laying a wreath for an Islamic terrorist saying I was there clearly you've got me on picture but I was not involved and and 
there, you know, it's very hard not to make this association with Justin Welby, who was clearly there. We know he was there, uh, but his defence maybe he was not involved. So we have to look at that defence, and what we find is that in 2013, one of the survivors uh, went to the police and went to the Bishop of Ely at the time. Uh, so you, you mic kind of went soft there. Can you tap your mic? It looks blue, and it's. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll let me turn your volume up for a second here. It, it just went soft. No big deal. Uh, we we have the power to change that. Okay, go for it. So, um, in two thousand and twelve, one of the victims went to the Bishop of Ely, who wrote a report and informed Canterbury and Lambeth, and they also informed the police. And the police sadly said, we don't feel we have quite enough evidence. Now, at this stage, both the police and the Bishop of Ely, but above all, the Archbishop of Canterbury, ought to have said, well, John Smythe has been accused of beating one boy privately on his bare bottom until he bled. We wonder if there are any others. But they did nothing. Until two years ago, when a TV company, a secular TV company, picked up on the story, and they decided to investigate, unlike Justin Welby, unlike the Bishop of Ely, unlike even the police. So they flew two reporters out to Cape Town and they tracked Smythe down where he was. And they said, what were you doing beating boys privately on their bottom until they bled? And how many were there? And Smythe prevaricated and ran away from them. Now, this is now two or three years ago. And still, can, can, when they uh, came back. Did Smythe still have his PTO at this point? Who? Smythe? Oh, he was a layman. He was a layman. Okay, right, right. Oh, okay. He right. was a layman. I'm so, there's, and, a, there's and, a difference. And, okay, right, okay. And I have to, and I have to say, mm -hmm. the UN camps are not formally part of the Church of England, but informally, everybody there was an Anglican. Okay. So now we have a situation where, where two years ago, the Archbishop of Canterbury now knows that Channel 4 have found Smythe. They've accused him to his face. He's prevaricated and run away. Uh, there's another. There's a report being done by a man called Mark Rushton, a vicar in Cambridge, mm -hmm. and Justin Welby is, is a house guest of Mark Rushton. Maybe they never talk about this. Maybe they do. But in 2012, Justin Welby said, I know nothing. I knew nothing at all. Since 2012, Channel 4 exposed him. Now Justin Welby does know. In the last two years, what has Justin Welby and Lambeth and Safeguarding done about Smythe? Nothing. Until this week, when they were just, when the police were just about to try and extradite him to bring him back for criminal charges, and much to the fury and the dismay of many of the boys he beat, he died from a heart attack. Now, the difficulty we have is this, that even if Justin Welby didn't know anything through the 1980s, and even if he really didn't know anything until 2013, as he said, he knew a lot two years ago. Uh, and there ought to be some consistency between the way in which he is treated for knowing and doing nothing and the standards to which he held George Carey, his predecessor, for knowing and doing nothing. Now, yeah. one could become smug at this point, and, and we'll try not to. But actually, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a serious, it's a serious charge. It is, because uh, Justin Welby took away the PTO, the, the ability to ha have a preaching license in England, to the former archbishop because he knew or should have known and had letters to prove accusations of the the, the bishop uh, uh ball affair bell ball which one peter ball, ball, ball. sorry ball. <laughs> it's hard too ball. many too many uh close uh, names over there and uh uh so he said listen you should have known and i'm taking away your pto you can't practice uh anything here on, on the shores of england if because you've let the site down yeah and so if you're going to be consistent justin welby you must also remove the pto from yourself am, am i wrong in this uh, unless there's information we don't have okay and, I, and, I mean, I and can't that's even possible what it is. that's possible but but yeah. but the, the fact is that that this has been in the public domain mm -hmm. for the last two years since Channel Four exposed him, and certain and, and and Welby himself made this, made a great apology in 2013. Welby said, uh, "From the bottom of my heart, I'm embarrassed on behalf of the Church of England for the dreadful things that this man has done." And he could then have said one or two things. And by the way, we're not going to look at this anymore. This is the end of the story. Or he could have said, uh, "Behind this." 
behind the little that we know already, there may be a lot more. We better go and find out. In the same way that the that ICSA, the Independent Child Abuse Inquiry, have went to find out about Peter Ball and then discovered the, the, the extent of it. The fact that from 2013, the Archbishop did not go and find out, even though all the evidence, much of the evidence was there, is, is really quite a serious charge for the Church of England and for safeguarding. And you have Peter Hancock, poor man, bishop in charge of safeguarding, reduced to this dreadful, lame, and I'm afraid pathetic formula that says, we are determined to go on learning lessons. Um, but you, you know, you can't, you, you, can only, you can only use that once or maybe twice, and then you have to stop using it. Yes. So, We've talked about a lot today, <laughs> obviously, uh, with Pennsylvania and, you know, what looks like hypocrisy uh, with uh, Archbishop Justin Welby. I would hope sometime this week or next week we see a, a press release from Church House or from Archbishop himself explaining, uh, you know, either where we're wrong, which is fine, uh, or... Uh, Removing PTO from Archbishop, we'll see. But you know what? What would what, you know, what, what would be great would be if Justin Welby said, "Kevin and Gavin are right." <laughs> oh, I don't. Ex I don't expect that. I know. But, but, but if he was, but if he was to say, "I apologise for for my own lapse in this. I should have been more thorough." Hmm. Do you know what, Kevin? Then he's forgiven, and we start again. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. and you know we. We do, despite my hatred of the phrase, we do learn lessons. But but it requires it requires an apology. I I don't know if people know this, but when we start this program, before we press record, before I do sound checks, before I turn my lights on, uh, we do prayer uh, and we pray and we ask forgiveness uh, for our sins and you know that uh, God would keep us very transparent, that we'd be encouragers and deliverers of news. Um, it's difficult this week especially after Pennsylvania um, it's also difficult to hold others you know to accuse others of hypocrisy especially an archbishop but sometimes it's just so clear and so visible you got to say something you got to say you know something. I hope we're not accusing I, I hope we're not accusing mm -hmm. I, I would I'd be sorry if I've yeah. if I've been that clumsy I, I hope what we're doing is we're we're raising the question and saying it looks like this Please either show us we're wrong or put it right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, because we are all hypocrites, <laughs> there is this huge gap between what we say and aspire to and who we are. Mm -hmm. And it, as you quite rightly say, it applies to us. Uh, but all, all that matters is we keep short accounts with God and with one another, and that we say sorry, we receive the forgiveness that Christ gave for us on the cross at the pain of his life and then we continue and that's what it is to be part of the church mm -hmm. that's why we can't ever leave the church because you know you know w without it where would our forgiveness and our hope lie uh, also i leave this program open to anybody over in england who wants to uh comment if archbishop uh, justin welby wants to come on unscripted and talk about uh, these accusations or possible hypocrisy you're welcome to uh y your staff knows by email i get Lots of stuff all the time. <laughs> I'm Kevin Carlson. <laughs> I'm Gavin Ashenden, and you've been listening to episode 428 of Anglican Unscripted. And please pray for Kevin and I, who lead the list of those who sin and fail, but hope all the same.